Hello, good afternoon and or good morning if you're in America um, and welcome to this event. How can governments stop COVID-19 from supercharging inequality organised by Oxfam and the Development Finance International? Um, my name's Aditya Chakraborty. I'm senior economics commentator for The Guardian newspaper. Um, and just by way of scene setting, um, a historian wrote of the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918-1919. The flu may have been democratic, but the society it struck was not. And so it is proved this time, because despite all the bromides that were issued at the start of this year about how we were all in it together, it's very clear that the coronavirus has hit poor countries the worst and poor people in rich countries also terribly badly. Um, so what can governments do to turn back uh, inequality, to, to deal with highly unequal societies which have been made even more unequal by this pandemic? Uh, to discuss that, we have uh, this afternoon's event. The idea is that we'll do an hour's discussion with panellists, who I'll introduce in a minute, and in half an hour's uh, worth of questions or thereabout. Um, we will... Um, have take questions on the um, not on the chat box icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen, but the Q and A icon next to it. So right next to where you can see the participants uh, 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 numbered there. Um, the event's also going. To, uh, if you want to uh, enter a, a question, just go to the Q and A icon. If you want to enter your name and organisation, that would also be helpful. Uh, we will be video recording this event. It's also being live streamed, I understand. And if you want to tweet about it, there is an obligatory hashtag, which you must use, called uh, Fight Inequality. Uh, anyway, let me introduce the speakers. The, um, the event will be uh, opened by Gabriella Boucher, who's Oxfam's new executive director. So welcome, Gabriella. Um, and then we will go to the panel, which will be moderated by me. Uh, on it, we have a great lineup. Uh, Gita Gopinath is the chief economist of the International Monetary Fund and director of the IMF's research department. Uh, Jacob Joseph Safa is the Minister of Finance of Sierra Leone, has been since April 2018. Uh, Joyti Ghosh is Professor of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And Matthew Martin is director of the nonprofit organization Development Finance International. Uh, so with that, let's start with a short video on Oxfam's commitment to reducing international inequality. Thank you, Aditya, and hello, everyone. Um, I think this video sets the tone for what is going to be a very exciting event today. I have the honor of welcoming all of you on behalf of Oxfam, and I'm thrilled to welcome our esteemed panelists, Minister Safa, Dr. Gopinath, Professor Ghosh, and Matthew, our close partner, who will guide us all through this important discussion. I, like many of you, I'm asking myself, how will history remember today's pandemic? And I will recall the pain, the lives lost, the livelihoods lost. And 
history may also look back into how inequalities soared all around us. So the story so far is that COVID-19 is supercharging inequality. Billionaire wealth is soaring at levels unimaginable amid estimates of as many as 500 million people being forced into poverty. We're seeing a huge toll on women, the shock absorbers of every crisis at every level of society. Of the millions of out of school children, um, the majority of girls are less likely to return to school in many countries after the pandemic. We're also seeing a huge impact on people of color. White supremacy still shapes our economies. The rising inequalities within nations are also clear. So it's why at Oxfam we call this the inequality virus. But it's also very clear that the next chapter is yet to be written. And this is why we wanted to hold this event today together with our partners, Development Finance International. Our new commitment to reducing inequality index is a tool made to help governments make the right choices. We analyze the policies of 158 countries um, and see how the governments are, are doing in areas that are vital to tackling inequality. And we show that no government on earth was doing enough before the pandemic. So consider that just how six, one in six um, governments were spending the widely accepted um, 15% uh, of budget on health in the run-up to the crisis, or how 10,000 people were dying every day for lack of access to healthcare, and that's pre-pandemic. And our data shows how in more than 100 countries, at least one in three workers had no labor protections such as sick pay. So let's say directly, these kind of economic decisions fueled by neoliberal economic thinking and political capture have made us all less safe. It's caused such avoidable death and destitution. But the index also gives us hope. It shows us that some governments are doing the right thing. So from South Korea, boosting minimum wages, taxing the rich more while investing more in health and education, to Sierra Leone, clamping down on tax evasion. During the pandemic, Denmark barred companies registered in tax havens from receiving COVID-19 bailouts. Or just look at Argentina a few days ago, passing a wealth tax to fund its COVID-19 recovery. That's bold and it's exciting. It reminds us that inequality isn't inevitable, but in the hands of government choices. It reminds us a different kind of economic model, one designed to realize human rights is possible. So I would leave, like to close with two reflections. First, that I think we're reaching a new consensus about the need to tackle inequality. Movements across the world have been calling attention to this crisis and it feels like the world is finally listening. The IMF itself has done a great deal of work on this as have brilliant economists like you, Jayati. But we can't just have new rhetoric masking old economics. We all need to work towards this common agenda of fighting inequality. And we're worried about harsh austerity measures on the horizon that could undermine this agenda. And the IMF holds huge influence here. We hope that to see the IMF fight inequality, not back austerity. The second reflection is that governments and global institutions are running out of time. Just before COVID-19 hit our world, people were bravely on the streets protesting in countries around the world saying no more to such extreme inequality, saying we can't go back. I want to end by saying we must listen to those voices on the streets in the communities. We surely have no other option. Let's have history remember governments coming out of this crisis in solidarity with their people to fight inequality. So over to you, Aditya. Thank you, Gabriella. Well, um, let's start with you, Matthew Martin. It's uh, of Development Finance International. This is your data that's powering the index, and this is your big moment. So tell us, who's doing well, who's not, and who are the surprises? You're on mute, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aditya. Uh, let me, before I get on to the results, talk about why we decided to have an index and how it's structured. Uh, why we decided to have an index is because uh, 
Um, there's a global consensus that extreme inequality across the world is undermining development and democracy, which is why the whole international community agreed on SDG 10 in 2015. But how do we measure progress on that? It's very difficult because most countries only track poverty and inequality about every five years through household surveys. So in 2018, DFI and Oxfam had the idea to measure the policies that governments take to reduce inequality and their impact, and to produce a commitment to reducing inequality index, measuring now 158 governments' performance. It turned out to be a very popular idea. Um, and I want to thank all the major uh, international organizations, including the ILO, UNESCO, WHO, UN Women, the IMF, the World Bank, plus a lot of academics, a lot of important stakeholders, including the ITUC, for their inputs, but especially the team uh, at DFI and Oxfam, who did a huge amount of extremely hard and intensive work to make this happen. The index is structured in three pillars, each of which represent one set of policies which have been shown by a wide range of research to reduce inequality. They look at public services, particularly on education, health, and social protection. They look at taxation, the structure of the taxation and wh whether it's collected. And they look at labor policies, particularly labor rights, notably for women and the minimum wage. And within each of those three pillars, we look at three different sets of indicators on the policy measures governments take, how successfully those policies are implemented and what their impact is on inequality. And we then combine them into an overall score and a ranking, which is analyzed in a report which is up on the website. So what are the results then in 2020? Well, as Gabriella said, overall in 2020, as we found in 2017 and 2018, previous editions of the index, almost all governments are falling way short of what they could do, of what the best governments are doing in particular areas. And in 2020, that was particularly vital because as a result, countries were woefully unprepared to fight COVID-19 or to stop it hitting in an unequal way because only half the world's population could access healthcare affordably, only a third of global workers had adequate social protection, and more than half of them had inadequate labor rights. But we also found some good news between 2017 and 2020. There was small progress in increasing anti-inequality spending, making tax systems more progressive, and increasing labor rights, notably for women, and raising minimum wages. Small progress on average, but some big progress in individual countries, which I hope we'll really focus on uh, in this event. Who's doing really well? So the biggest message I think from the report is that you don't have to be rich to be committed to reducing inequality. Many richer countries do well in the index and this time Norway, Denmark and Germany come top and that reflects their history of social mobilization and their higher levels of wealth so they can spend more on fighting inequality. But a lot of non-OECD and poorer countries are also showing strong commitment on paper. Some of them are the ones that have the highest shares of social spending in their budgets, the most progressive tax systems and improving labor rights. Where they tend to fall down on is the in, in detailed implementation of those policies due to widespread global tax dodging in particular, but also due to the informal nature of many of their labor sectors where people don't have formal labor contracts. And if you look at the standout improvers since we started measuring back in 2017, we've seen countries from lots of different income levels. So we've seen countries like Gabriella referred to Korea's really heroic efforts. New Zealand has done a really good job, but we've also seen Sierra Leone who are on this call with us and Costa Rica doing a really good job too. Who's not doing so well? Um, well, uh, South Sudan and Nigeria are at the bottom. Uh, and it's true that the very bottom of the index is populated largely by poorer countries emerging either in or emerging from war. Uh, but you can still be rich and do badly as well. So Bahrain and Oman and Singapore are also near the bottom of the index. And many other OECD countries have been rowing backwards recently through tax and social spending cuts. One of the interesting things we found this time is that, uh, for example, South Africa and the Ukraine now score better than the UK and the US respectively because of the recent policies of governments in, in the UK and the US. And there are also some really standout global policy holes that the whole international community needs to get together to tackle. There are 34 countries with virtually no social protection system of any kind, five countries without any income taxes, 14 countries with no independent trade unions, 16 countries with no adequate gender labor laws, 12 countries with no minimum wages. Those are just, I think in this day and age, scandalous lacks of policy, not just to fight inequality, but, but on a moral basis to even care about your citizens. We really need to do more about that. Finally, let me uh, then talk about where we are in what COVID has impacted on this and what we think are the recommendations going forward. 
Um, so as Gabriella said, uh, and as Aditya said, COVID has been exacerbating inequality dramatically. The poor and groups suffering from racial discrimination or marginalization have been worsted in terms of health outcomes and in their income. And the policy responses we've seen have been large increases in OECD health and social protection spending, but much less of this in lower, lower income countries, low income countries and middle income countries. And most of these, these spending increases have not focused enough on fighting inequality, on really getting the money to the poorest. And I think most important, uh, there's been much less progress on how we actually find a sustainable way to pay for these spend the spending in a way which fights inequality. Notably by making taxes more progressive. There have been some really good, Gabriela cited the example of Argentina's solidarity tax, but there have also been really good measures taken by Mauritius and Uruguay, um, but also by fighting global tax dodging. And so we end the report by presenting recommendations, which probably won't be a, a big shock to anyone because they've been being discussed, but we're reinforcing them from the point of view of fighting inequality, that we need to mobilize much more tax in a progressive way, debt relief, aid, and SDRs, so that we can be sure we fund a dramatic post-COVID fall in inequality across the world. Thanks. Thank you, Matthew. Um, Gita Gopinath at the IMF, if I could come to you. The, the inequality index for this year is a, is a scene setter, really, showing us the, the state of inequality before we went into the pandemic. But what Gabriella referred to as the inequality virus, how bad do you think it could get as a result of this pandemic? You have to unmute. We're all, I'm all, we're all doing this. <laughs> anyway, I was saying, I was saying hello to everybody. Uh, but yes, uh, you know, this, this indeed has been a, a crisis that has hit low-income households, low-skilled workers, young workers, women much more harder than it has hit high-skilled workers, high, high-income households. So there is no doubt that we are seeing uh, an increase in inequality, that there is a big risk of an increase in inequality. And we, for instance, we have our own projections region by region of what would happen to the Gini coefficient, given what we know about which uh, income groups are being affected, which kinds of jobs are being affected most by this pandemic. And everything points to a worsening in inequality and a pretty significant worsening in inequality. And this worsening is not just uh, about within countries, but it's also across countries. So when I look ahead into 2021, with the backdrop of all the, the good news that we are having on vaccine discovery, uh, you know, on one hand, it it's tells you that 2021 could be the year when we see that strong rebound coming back in the world. But at the same time, every most of the indicators point to this risk of the K-shaped recovery, which is a recovery where some people do really well within countries, others don't. Some, some countries as a whole do better than uh, other countries do. So that K-shaped recovery is a real risk. Uh, I mean, as you already have it, it's not just a risk, you're seeing it right now, but it getting, it getting aggravated is a, is a very important uh, risk. And secondly, I do worry that once, the, once we actually have the problem solved in advanced economies, that maybe it will be then forgotten. That there's, that there's still much of the world that's left uh, that is grappling with the pandemic that will not get the vaccine well into 2022. So we have to come back into solutions of that kind. But let me also make a second point, which is that it's, this is not just about now, but it's about how the, you know, the variation and how different people have been hit uh, you know, leave scars into the future. So let me give you just a couple of examples. One is on the education front. Uh, I'm very worried, we are very worried that we have a large, very large millions of kids who've, uh, you know, at one point billion or, one, or, or over a billion kids uh, that were affected by the fact that they, they lost learning. They, can, they had no access to schooling. Many of them will permanently leave schooling. Uh, and that's true even in poor countries, but also within rich countries, you see a great differentiation. And that is a loss of human capital that will not automatically fix itself. So it has to be addressed by appropriate policies. So that's a very important issue. Second is this is a crisis that's leading 
to more rapid automation, more rapid digitalization. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with technology in and of itself, but we do know that that was one of the reasons why you had a hollowing out of the middle class, where you have people who fall behind and a rising inequality. So that's another big area that needs to be addressed. We have half of the world without access to the internet. There, there is the great digital divide, uh, and that's another area that needs to be fixed. So there are both near-term concerns on inequality and worsening and long-term concerns. And like we all said here, we didn't enter this crisis with a very good story on, on inequality. Thank you, Geeta. Um, Minister Safa, if I could come to you now. Um, from where you sit in Sierra Leone, you were given a commendation by, by Matthew at the start uh, for, your, for the actions of your government in tackling inequality. What would you say other governments should, should be doing now to, to, to prevent inequality getting really out of control as a result of the pandemic? Thank you very much, Moderator. Um, thank you very much. And let me thank the, 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 the organizers of this event for the invites. I feel highly honored to participate in this on such high level panel. First, uh, this government believes that inequality is in those development. And therefore we, we, we are the centerpiece of our development is human center development. And therefore we focus in on economic management with the human face. Right. To that end, given the wide disparities among incomes, one of the first tax we, tax we set for ourselves was to increase the minimum wage. We have, we've been able to increase the minimum wage by about 20% and we press to do that for come 2022 as well. We also increased the minimum wage pay to pensioners. We, 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 we have increased that by about tenfold. We've increased salaries of all government workers by at least 30%, between 30% and 80%, particularly for the health workers during the pandemic. We've been able to do that. But most significantly, Given the high level of illiteracy, about 40, about 60 percent, this government, on coming to an assumption of office, deem it very necessary to introduce free quality school education. And we've persistently sustained the, 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 the national budget spent on education between 21 percent and 22 percent. As of this year, last year, 22 percent, this year, 22 percent of the national budget is used for education. And we, we've introduced free tuition, uh, free school, uh, school feeding, providing textbooks, core textbooks, subsidized bus transportation. All these have impacted positively on the savings of households, which they now use the, the, the extra disposable income for consumption or for, for, for investment. And it's been also interesting that in terms of results, the enrollment figures have increased by about 30% at all levels on average. I mean, for even pre promise it increased about 40%. Before the introduction of the free quality school education, we had about 1.9 million children in school. Now, as I speak to you, we have about, as at last year, we had about 1.6 million, uh, 2.6 million in school, about 700 additional learners. And we expect that number to increase. We, we, we've sustained the free health care for lactating mothers and pregnant women. We're planning to roll out that to school going children come next year. And we've also expanded the free health care to include persons living with disability. That's on the, on the earth front. But quite apart from that, within the context of fighting the COVID, we are also looking at strengthening the health systems, improving diagnostic systems, and I mean, I mean, I mean, bringing health care to the doorsteps of people in order to reduce spending on health care. But also significantly, the social safety net which you have provided. I mean, amidst the crisis, amidst the challenges, we've provided thousands of people uh, a social safety net, but including persons living with disabilities, many with persons 65 years, youth, hotel workers, or persons who are in sectors affected, significantly affected by the COVID, but we give us some compensation packages. So overall, we've, we've addressed the issues of education, and we are still addressing it. More need to be done, because there have been a substantial gap before we came in. The free health care, more need to be done, but we have within the policy framework we have are well in place. Safety nets, we are expanding and we hope to expand that. But uh, in addition to all those things, we're providing additional livelihood support to SMEs and other uh, 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 support to, 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 to families in order to, to raise their income levels. We government, conceptually, we've thought also that agriculture is so key 
in the in the in fight against poverty, and we think agriculture support learning. It also support uh, health, health, uh, effective healthcare delivery. Therefore, we 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 expanding our interventions in the area of agriculture as well. With the hope that that can provide food for the very poor people at, at low at low cost. So we 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 we, we try this extremely difficult in our context. But one, one of the things I will tell you that we've not been able, we've not, we've not, we've, we've not cut down the budget in these areas, even in the, in the midst of COVID. We've sustained those budget provisions, we've provided those budget provisions, and we are pressed to do more of that as we go along. I mean, when we, we had the health crisis, uh, the, 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 the outbreak of the pandemic, one thing we did quickly was we developed the health response plan at the same time with the quick action economic response plan. I mean, I mean, and then the quick action economic response plan was a framework for mobilizing resources and protecting the budget. We also quickly did uh, do the supplementary budget that protected all these things. So we just didn't do it by policy, but we did really did, did a budget which we took to, to the legislature and it was approved so that there's a legal basis for us sustaining those health care. I mean, by and large, for those who have been working on Sierra Leone and for partners who are here, I'm proud to say that in the, in the midst of difficulties, we've been able to sustain uh, provisions affecting the poor. We have to cut down other expenses, but we, as much as we can, we protect our expenditures relating to the poor. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you. Just a reminder to uh, participants that if you want to put a question, you can go to the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and pop one in there. Uh, put in your name and organisation if you'd like. Um, I want to throw a, a quick question to Gita and then go to Joyti if I could. Um, Gita, after the last unprecedented financial crisis, which was all of just over 10 years ago, the IMF was very supportive of government spending money initially and then after a couple of years it started talking a lot more about austerity. Um, I opened my FT uh, a few weeks ago and I noticed that the economics editor there had come out of the IMF World Bank annual meetings uh, and said we are now we have now witnessed the funeral of austerity. What's so different this time? I think um... A big a lesson learned, and I would say there's consensus on that, was that uh, policy support was withdrawn too quickly after the global financial crisis. Uh, and that was part of the reason why it took about a decade to, to see anything close to a proper recovery. So I think that's a lesson learned. Uh, and uh, that's why this time around, everybody, including the IMF, has made it very clear that it is absolutely essential not to prematurely withdraw support. Now, I also do want to make the point, of course, that these two crises are very different. Uh, and in the past two, when we have, uh, you know, we've had uh, given advice to countries who are dealing with epidemics, uh, in that case, we have absolutely said that now is the time that you have to spend, you have to deal with the health crisis. So it's different. But that said, I, I think the broader point that you need to, uh, to undertake necessary spending uh, to prevent the economy from going into a bigger hole, but also to, and to prevent loss of livelihoods uh, is absolutely essential to prevent long-term scarring. And I, so I just want to make a point in that regard that this time around, it is, it is while we all worry about worsening inequality, uh, especially in the rich countries, I think it could have been a lot worse because policies have actually played a very important role getting income into the hands of, uh, of uh, needy households. So, you know, we, I give credit where credit is due. Policies did respond to very large packages. But of course, there's a difference across parts of the world. Advanced economies spent about 20% of their GDP on providing fiscal support measures. Emerging markets only could do 6% and low-income countries could only do 2%. So there's a lot, large variation there. But again, we have to recognize that this time around, policymakers around the world did respond much better than the last time. Uh, Joyti, if I could come to you now, what, what's your reading of the situation uh, across developed and, and developing countries? 
Um, do you see a, a real shift away from austerity, the, the death of austerity? Uh, thank you, Aditya. And, you know, thank you, Oxfam, for inviting me to this fascinating discussion. No, I don't see the death of austerity, unfortunately. Uh, from the developing world, it's, it's alive kicking and kicking very hard, I would say, at the moment. So I think Gita is absolutely right that the IMF leadership has changed its position. There's no question about it. I think Gita herself and uh, the managing director, Kristalina mm -hmm. Georgieva, they have all made excellent statements about the need to keep a positive fiscal stance, ensure employment and livelihood and all of those things. Unfortunately, you know, the IMF on the ground, <laughs> I wish you could explain to the rest of your office, Gita, that the IMF on the ground is not, doesn't seem to have got this memo. Uh, whether you look at what is demanding of Argentina, whether you look at what reports tell us is going to happen in Ecuador, various countries in Asia that are facing IMF programs and going through rather bitter negotiations, austerity is still the name of the game cutting back on public sector, on wage freezes, on you know everything. And even where there are countries that don't have the IMF, my, our own country, for example, the Indian central government has spent less in aggregate in the last nine months in real terms than it spent the previous year. So we are talking about unbelievable, incredible austerity in the midst of a pandemic. The Indian government actually spending less in health, on health in real terms than it spent and as well in the aggregate. So I think if I had to think of what could be done, I mean, you know, it was so impressive to hear Minister Safa talk about the things that can be done. I would like to think of the international arrangements that would enable things to be done. And if I could, if you allow me, I'll just sort of specify three thou shalt nots and three thou shalts, if you like. <laughs> so the first thou shalt not very obviously is avoiding austerity. And I, I think Gita's absolutely right that the advanced economies did that to a significant extent, most of the developing world did not. And in fact, even you know, the IMF estimates of government spending are largely based on what they announced, not what they've actually done. And when you look at many countries of what they've done, they've done less than they certainly could have, but also than they did the previous year, which is unimaginable in many ways. So avoiding austerity, put money in the hands of those who will spend, that's good macroeconomics, but it also reduces inequality. It also ensures some access to basic services, health, education, and all of the things that were mentioned earlier. The second thou shalt not is about intellectual property rights. And I think this is very important right now because we are in a process where a vaccine is being, two vaccines have already been approved. The third one is about to be approved. We know there are several in the running, but they are subject to patent laws that will limit the production and therefore limit access. And in that period, people will die. Economies will not recover. Livelihoods will be lost. The longer we take to distribute these vaccines globally, the worse the problem will become for very many countries. It's extremely unequal globally, the distribution of vaccines, but also the support for the patent laws. In the WTO, India, South Africa, and a bunch of other developing countries have brought a case asking for the suspension of the patent regime for COVID-19 drugs and vaccines for this period. It's being opposed by guess who? If you look at the map of the world, who says North South divide doesn't exist? All the advanced countries virtually are opposing this. All the developing world is in favor of it. I think it's very important uh, because it has implications beyond health. It's very important to actually uh, not use intellectual property rights to prevent the production and distribution of life-saving vaccines at this point. Uh, the third, well, I'll keep the last thou shalt not for the last. The, the first thou shall, I think, has already been mentioned about tax dodging. I think, you know, all of you mentioned it really. Uh, we really need global tax cooperation and it is low hanging fruit. It's available. It can be done very, very easily. We know what have to, has to be done. The OECD has been working on something like this. It came very close to something. I think multinational lobbies managed to prevent it happening. But essentially, what we need to do to begin with is prevent multinationals from avoiding taxation almost altogether, including the digital companies that have benefited so much from the pandemic, mm. by reducing the possibilities of base erosion and profit shifting. And that's quite easy to do if you institute a unitary taxation, that is tax a multinational company as one unit. And every country takes its share of the profits based on a formula of sales, employment, users, 
and actually says we will tax your global profits according to this, for which you need a uni uniform tax rate. I'm a member of a commission, the International Commission for International Corporate Taxation, which has suggested 25% as a minimum tax. But you know, one can discuss the tax rate. But the point is, once you have a minimum tax, there's no incentive. Once you have a global unitary tax, there's no incentive for a corporation like Apple or Google to say all its profits are made in Amazon, in, in Ireland, or some of it is made in the Netherlands or in Delaware or something. You can actually ensure that everybody, that multinational companies pay the same tax rate as domestic companies. Similarly, wealth tax, to avoid high net worth individuals from shifting their money out, you can have a global asset register. Every country publishes, it doesn't have to be, it can be anonymous, but it can be named in certain ways that you actually know who owns what where. And that reduces to a significant extent, the incentive to just shift your money out whenever you think that there's going to be a wealth tax imposed in your own country. So tax cooperation is the first thou shall. The second thou shall I know Gita will agree with because the IMF had proposed it earlier is, is a big issue of SDRs. I mean, the IMF had proposed 50, 500 million. I would say at least a trillion is required by now because things have got significantly worse since it was first proposed. Uh, the US and remarkably the Indian government had opposed it at that time. I'm hoping that the new US government will not oppose it and that we would actually get an issuance of SDRs, which would hugely alleviate the problems of developing countries. Uh, the third thou shall, I think, is to immediately bring about some kind of a sovereign debt resolution mechanism. It's remarkable to me that so many developing countries are facing massive problems of debt servicing. Often, I mean, it's true, many of them had problems well before the pandemic started, but then this thing happens and this tsunami happens and we don't make any allowances. The same allowances that governments in rich countries are making to their own companies are not being made for the sovereign debt of developing countries. For the extremely poor, you get a debt moratorium, which kicks the can down the road and makes it larger because the interest payments keep getting added up. But we don't actually have a proper mechanism for the entire range of developing countries, including some middle income countries that are facing debt crisis. And I think some debt restructuring absolutely essential. Final thou shall, if you like, is, you know, we have to get over this GDP fetish. And I, we've been saying, many people have been saying this for a while, but it doesn't go away, right? Even now, when people talk about recovery, it's all in GDP terms. A lot of the times, I mean, then, of course, there are incentives for governments to fudge the GDP data. We all know how several countries are doing that. But it also captures the wrong thing. And if we are really interested in improving livelihoods, improving people's conditions of life and work, reducing inequality, let's just pick on some other indicators. And if, let's say, the IMF also says we are giving significance to this indicator along with GDP, say employment, good quality employment, or mass consumption, basic needs, you know, any one of these, and puts it there as important, as significant as the GDP quarterly data, which we all know is, is a big fudge. The quarterly data are really, you know, guesstimates of the highest order. So supposing the IMF puts its weight behind at least one other indicator that will force governments like my own in India, where employment has been falling dramatically even before the pandemic and has absolutely collapsed since good quality employment in particular. If that other number was there alongside GDP with equal status, I think it would make a huge difference to policy making and to the ability of people to actually demand different policies. Thanks. Thank you, Joyti. Um, if I could go to Geeta and just pick up on one of the points made by Joyti there. Wealth taxes are something which are obviously in the headlines, whether in Argentina or in the UK, where uh, a commission supported by our former head of the civil service has just proposed levying something like £250 billion pounds worth of wealth taxes. Do you welcome wealth taxes? Charity, first, I'd, I'd like to uh, respond to one of the, on other point that you had made, which is that there might be a disconnect between what uh, is said at the leadership and what's happening on the ground. I think that's factually not correct. We have uh, assisted 83 countries in this crisis and 77 of them received emergency financing with no conditionality, which is not typical America, uh, sorry, IMF uh, 
uh, practice. And, and so this, this has been a crisis where we recognized that this is a shock that countries didn't bring upon themselves. It's an exogenous shock. They have important spending needs, uh, which affect lives. I mean, health spending is necessary, livelihoods, making sure you have cash transfers to the poorest households. And so we have given emergency financing uh, to countries uh, to meet these kinds of needs with no say, no requirement that they have to announce some policies for how they're going to uh, bring back, uh, you know, do something about their deficits in the future. So that's, so, I mean, I, I want to be, I want to be uh, uh, very uh, clear about that. Uh, I also agree on the point about the fact that debt sustainability is an issue for some countries and just having a moratorium is kicking the can down the road. So that clearly doesn't do solve the problem. Uh, the G20 just, uh, you know, agreed on a common framework, which is about providing, uh, you know, restructuring the debt of, uh, of countries that are in distress, uh, having a level playing field across all the creditors, Paris, non-Paris, uh, you know, private sector. Now, of course, how, all, how well this works depends on the implementation and, and that's to be seen and we're providing support on that front. Uh, and, but that is, I agree that that is something that one cannot postpone and that's, that's very important. On your question on wealth taxes, so our view, our view generally is that we, have, we believe that there is an argument for a solidarity tax, which is that this has been a crisis where, um, you know, some, some, uh, some firms, some companies have uh, gotten abnormal profits because of virtue of the kind of business that they're in. And we can think of solidarity tax. There are questions about whether this should be a wealth tax of a different form. Sometimes it's just, you know, you don't really, it's not, it doesn't implement very well a wealth tax. So there are issues with how much you can raise. So there are, I'm not going to get into wealth tax, wealth tax specific, specifically, but I think we see an argument for, uh, for one-off tax. But again, it's also endorsed completely the point that both JIT made and, and, uh, and you know, Jacob made, which is uh, the fact that we need uh, an international tax system that's appropriate for the 21st century where we don't have tax shifting, we don't have companies that pay absolutely 0% in taxes that's appropriate for digital, the digital economy we live in. So I think um, you know, we agree on all those fronts. Thank you, Geeta. Um, Matthew, if I could uh, extend the question to you, how much difference do would you say wealth taxes actually make in terms of you compiling your data at the end at the end of the year? How much difference do wealth taxes make to actually combating inequality as opposed to spending more on education and health or, or whatever? So I think it varies a lot between countries. Um, there, there are some countries, as I said in my in my opening, um, which don't even have the basic income taxes. And for them, probably the way they can mobilize the most money to fight inequality, fight the pandemic, is to introduce those taxes. Then there are some countries which have flat taxes uh, or very unprogressive income taxes, and they could really work on those. Uh, and then there are countries which have a pretty progressive income tax system uh, for, for personal income tax and are reasonably good at collecting the basics of corporate taxes. And therefore, they should be thinking about wealth taxes, solidarity taxes. But I do just want to add, add one point to what Dieter said. I, sorry, Matthew, I can, can, I, can I just, can I just sure. pause you there? Which countries are crying out for wealth tax then? Well, I think wealth taxes, as Gita hinted at, I think are easier to implement in countries where you are already tracking what's going on with the wealth. And as, as uh, uh, Jayati said, where you can have a global asset register to complement that for, for lower income countries. Obviously, the, mo the countries with the most unequal wealth, the hugest stocks of wealth, which would be most easily taxed and could mobilize the most revenue, are the OECD countries. But then there are some surprising ones like South Africa or India or most of Latin America, where there are also massive stocks of wealth uh, held overseas where you could have large tax revenues. But I, I really want to make the point that this has got to not just be a one-off tax. It seems to me we've got to use building back after COVID to get us into a situation where we don't have another pandemic in say 10 years from now or another disastrous event. And we're complaining mm -hmm. that we still don't have revenue to deal with it. 
countries have had very successful experiences with long-term solidarity taxes to do things like providing universal health coverage or universal so social protection for their citizens. And if we're serious about actually reaching those, those broader SDGs, then we've got to have proper long-term solidarity taxes, which don't just apply to a few people who profited out of the pandemic, but apply to everybody as we all start making profits and better incomes when we get back into recovery. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Minister Safi, if I could put a question to you. One of the themes that's been coming out of this discussion uh, has, of course, been the, um, the, 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 the crippling level of debt servicing uh, affecting poorer countries. How badly has it affected your own country, Sierra Leone? Yeah, thank you very much, Madhugatu. I think, it, uh, honestly, it's, it's, it's a very serious and worrying problem. And the quicker we improve on that situation, the better it is for us. Uh, on average, the debt service takes about 25 to 30% of the budget, which is more than what we spend on education. Education at about 22%. It's struggling between 8 and 10%. That's quite significant. So you are really saying that both health and education put together, our spending law then is equal to the debt service. Basically, on, on, on a weekly, like weekly uh, revenue collected from all sources, 25 to 30% of that is due to the, to the servicing. Um, it's, 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 it's not more of the extent of debt that has become the problem, because we inherited a very huge uh, domestic debt as well. I mean, the uh, previous government built up substantial areas which we are struggling to pay. The issue has a lot of the domestic bonds, the treasury bills, securities, which we are struggling to pay. Then of course, on the external side, we also have some external debt, but the, the, that one, as I said, in as much as the debt stock is significant and is, is worrying, I would, our major problem we have domestically is the domestic debt itself. And the fact that a big chunk of our revenue is used to take care of that debt, I mean, far uh, over and above that in education, it's quite an overwhelming concern. So it's, it's quite substantial, I must say. Thank you, Minister. Um, Joyti, um, if I could come to you. So far, we've had lots of discussion about policies, um, a lot of discussion about economics, of course, but not much about politics. And yet it strikes me that this discussion would be uh, in a bubble, if we didn't talk a bit about some of the some of the raw politics of this moment, one of the really striking things about uh, the, the the later months of this pandemic is the pressure that there's been on Amazon with the campaign to make Amazon pay and quite direct targeting of Jeff Bezos. Do you think that's helpful? Would you like to see more of it? Look, I think there, there is probably a, a significant social consensus that the global tech behemoths have gone out of control. So it's not a question of whether a particular president likes a particular leader of a particular tech company. It is that the large digital companies have been extremely monopolistic in their behavior and anti-competitive, that they have now got global reach and global power on an unprecedented scale. And they are abusing that in various different ways, that they're using data in all kinds of problematic ways, sometimes along with governments to encourage monitoring surveillance, that they're also using it politically to manipulate information, but at the, also most of all, that they are suppressing competition in a whole range of areas. So I actually think it's very positive that the US department, um, various federal agencies and uh, state governments have brought on cases against Google and against Amazon and Facebook in the recent past. I think it's very positive that the EU is talk has already brought on cases but, and is also talking about new forms of regulation. Because I do believe that the emergence of these digital companies, let's call them monopolies, which is what they are, is creating all kinds of new regulatory challenges that we haven't fully come to grips with. And these have implications, not just for the structure of our economies and the nature of competition, they have implications for democracy, for privacy, for citizens' rights, for a whole range of things. And so we definitely need to break them up, to regulate them, and to think of new ways of handling how such companies can behave in future. 
I haven't even brought in the tax, the tax issue. These are companies that pay virtually no tax that are among the companies that were talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, Geeta, uh, just before we go to questions from, from participants, I want to throw you the last question. One of the reasons why rich countries have been able to keep spending as they have is they've often lent upon their own central banks to, 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 to buy their debt uh, in the form of quantitative easing. Huge amounts going out the door in the UK, in Europe, in, in America. There's a real risk, isn't there, of a kind of monetary apartheid opening up between rich countries and poor countries whose central banks aren't able to do the same. Are you worried about that? Well, I mean, the way I see it is what monetary policy has done uh, in advanced economies is completely consistent with their mandate. Uh, and it is what they should do. I think this is an important time where both fiscal policy and monetary policy has to work together. So it is very welcome uh, collaboration. Uh, when, you, when you are a central bank and you're looking at your indicators of what's happening to employment or inflation, depending on your mandate, uh, this is a time when you should be supportive and quantitative easing does, does provide uh, that kind of support. So that's, that is this right. What we have seen this time around, which is quite unique to this crisis, is that for the first time we've seen emerging markets also, not everybody, some emerging markets enter into uh, do quantitative easing for the first time. So, you know, they have also been able to do that. But the question is who's been able to do that? And these have been countries that have built up central bank credibility. Uh, yeah, they've been, uh, you know, where you don't have to worry about uh, uh, loss of central bank independence. Those have been able to do it more successfully than others have been able to. So more generally, of course, if you step back, it's always been the case that if you are a reserve currency issuer, uh, in, in, you know, then in that, war, in that case, you're able to borrow more cheaply on the market. Uh, you have the institutions to back it up. Uh, and that gives you, you know, gives you uh, the ability to borrow at very cheap rates. While on the other hand, for many uh, developing economies, they are not in that position. They're not reserve currency issuers. They don't necessarily have the strength of the institutions to back up uh, doing monetary financing uh, and, or you know, any form of it. And so, uh, you know, so, so th there are challenges that they face. And so, so yes, yeah, so I think going forward, especially looking into 2021, while you can see advanced economies having the fiscal space to continue to support a recovery, it's becoming a, a more and more of a challenge in poorer countries. Thank you, Geeta. Um, okay, so as promised, uh, we've allotted uh, just over half an hour in this case for questions and answers uh, and they've been coming in if you want to put your own in there's a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen don't use a chat icon use a Q&A icon um, brief answers please from the panel to, to each of these I'll do these kind of quick fire uh, for Minister Safa we've got a question from Hua uh, in Oxfam Vietnam so she's watching this quite late in the evening which makes her a model employee. Um, can you tell us what kind of pushback your government has faced as you've embarked on policies to reduce inequality? Brief answer, please, Mr. Sapper. Sorry, sorry, I didn't get you. Could you come again? So, can you tell us what pushback your government has faced as it has embarked on policies to reduce inequality? What have the challenges been? Okay, well, thank you very much. Well, first, the, the, what some of the challenges include one is it's a fiscal related because if you don't have resources to take care of social services, that that's is that naturally is a challenge. Quite apart from that, there are structural weaknesses in the distribution mechanisms. So all the structural weaknesses have to have, have be addressed I mean, in terms of service delivery challenges, down from the central level to the rural level. We have a decentralized system of government, but we have fairly weak structures. I mean, I mean, it's, it's not like a today's business. It has emerged over the years, and those structures need to be to be effective, not only in delivery but even monitoring the, the, those structures. That's why the, the 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 opportunities, of course, is a political way. But principally, what I see as a major problem is, if, is the limited fiscal space, as a result of the drop in GDP overall, huge debt servicing problem, a problem with dropping consumption of financing, but also the structural challenges we face in terms of service delivery. So to me, these are the key challenges in terms of fighting inequalities. Thank you, Minister. 
A uh, question now for Matthew from John Stever at I for Policy. Uh, a, a very good question, this. Um, he asks, can I ask what role you see for more inclusive policy making processes? For example, do you see a role for citizen assemblies uh, and other such deliberative and particip participatory processes to engage communities and citizens themselves in these important decisions on how to create recovery solutions? Matthew, if you could answer as briefly as you can, please. Well, the very, very brief answer would be yes, definitely. But let me just expand on that a little bit. Uh, mm. You often hear people saying that the reason why you get more progressive policies in the world is that there's been a crisis, a depression, a war, a pandemic. But actually what creates change is, the crisis is only the moment of opportunity. What creates change is political and social mobilization. So you spoke at the beginning, a teacher, about the, the, the first flu pandemic and, and what happened in, for example, Scandinavia, which in a sense set off the whole uh, trend towards uh, more progressive policies in OECD countries was that after the flu pandemic in 1918-19, coalitions of workers and small farmers got together and fought for a progressive tax uh, system and a welfare state. And more recently, you've had the same thing happening, mobilization against inequality and moral injustice in Korea or in Latin America. That explains why then inspired leaders who are prepared to use power to take and sustain policy risks are able to do so. I, I, I would just though, I think it's really important that, that citizens are not just consulted, but actually in the lead and that therefore uh, in anti-inequality movements like the Fighting Inequality Alliance are, are prioritized in all of this to mobilize around, around values of dignity and moral justice, which is, this is really the moral issue of our time. Um, and I'm, I definitely think that judging by the experience of places like Ireland on, on various of those moral issues, uh, citizens assemblies could probably be a very good way of working out what are the policies that are in the best interest of everybody and will lead to not just reduced inequality, but faster growth and development. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, question now for Joyty from Rick Rowden uh, at Global Financial Integrity. What scope is there for developing economies to use more expansionary fiscal and monetary policies? I think it depends very much on the context of the specific country. I mean, uh, India, there is, I think, a huge amount of scope. In fact, it's a complete mystery why the Indian government has not been much, much more expansionary and has, because we don't have a balance of payments problem at the moment, we don't have a large external debt, there's really nothing constraining us. There are a bunch of other countries that face very severe external constraints, uh, particularly debt service has already been mentioned, but a bunch of other things where there's a real sort of foreign exchange limitation. So I think you, it's, it, it varies by the category of the country that you're looking at. I will say, however, that Ultimately, the, the sort of the tyranny of the logic of fiscal austerity is still very, very critical in restricting fiscal space, whether it is internalized in the minds of a particular country's government, as has happened in India, or whether it is externally imposed by the conditions that, you know, if you spend a lot and you are happening to be a, an emerging market with, you know, more fragile balance of payments, you will get a massive capital flight and the bond markets and everybody else will punish you for it. Or if you are facing, including, you know, uh, middle income emerging markets, you are facing an IMF program where you're not one of the extremely poor who is a beneficiary of the emerging financing, emergency financing, but you nonetheless have to deal with, let's face it, Gita, you still have to deal with those IMF teams who come and tell you as they are in Argentina and Ecuador today to freeze wages, cut public sector salaries, and do all of those other things. So I think, um, unfortunately, uh, austerity is a hydra-headed monster that is still with us. And uh, that's, I think, ultimately the, ma the major constraint. Thank you, Joyce. Um, Geeta, if I could follow up on that with not one, but two questions uh, for from two different questioners. So first, there's Leo from Public Services International. Uh, in the lead up to COVID-19, the IMF told 24 countries facing critical health worker shortages to cut or freeze public employment funding, hampering their ability to respond to the pandemic. Given that the research shows IMF austerity programs undermine public health programs and increase income inequality, is the IMF finally ready to consider a full-scale policy overhaul? Uh, 
I'm going to add to that another question that's just come in from Chiara Mariotti at Eurodad, who asks, if the IMF is serious about preventing a return to austerity, it's not enough to tell countries that it's okay to spend. It also needs to put them in the conditions to do so. For example, let them use exchange rate management and capital controls. So the question is whether the IMF is ready to do this and how it plans to do so. Gita, two questions for you. So I think that both these questions require a whole day of conversation. This is not something we'll be bringing in issues no, not five minutes. Uh, on, uh, on, on capital controls on, and exchange rates. And these are all very good questions. And we, you know, I would have to go into much greater depth on this. But let me just step back and say a couple of things. One is that the IMF has, has uh, moved along in the sense of adapting to the, to the lessons that have been learned. Uh, and if you look at the programs that the IMF, the more recent programs over the last uh, several years, you will see that there's a great emphasis on ensuring that there is social protection. There are countries that we've gone in and put and where the programs involve actually increasing the social safety net. So you actually have an increase the, the number of people who are getting access to uh, support from their government. That's a, require, that's a part of the program, which of course we always work with the governments on coming up with. Uh, it, in, in the past, in the way, way past, it used to be the case that it was just about the fiscal number and, and bringing it down or reducing the fiscal deficit. But now it is far more focused on where exactly are we trying to reduce the spending and making sure that it doesn't affect those who are already vulnerable and already suffering. So we are moving in that direction. But I just also want to step back and say that when, when the IMF goes to a country, it's usually a country that doesn't have access uh, on, at reasonable terms in the market. Uh, and so if the IMF actually didn't come in, these would be countries that would have to cut back on their spendings even more drastically than, any, than with the IMF support. So these are difficult these are difficult moments for countries. So it's not as if the option is, do I spend more or do I spend even more? I mean, this is a time when difficult decisions have to be made. And let's also keep in mind that, uh, you know, debt, that problems in terms of debt sustainability also come from, in some cases, from decisions that are made at the country level, policies at the country level that are just not sustainable. So again, we take a case by case approach one big lesson that we have learned and that we have moved to in a very big way is making sure that the most vulnerable don't get affected. But there are countries where you have wealthy households who pay almost no taxes. They, the taxation isn't collected. So often our focus is on making sure that they pay their taxes and the tax base uh, is improved. Uh, on questions of capital controls and uh, exchange rate uh, policies, again, this is very country specific and I don't want to make a blanket statement over here. Uh, I just, I will just flag that we are working for instance right now on an integrated policy framework uh, at the IMF. We've recently put out a technical work on that, which is precisely about how countries can use a combination of a monetary policy, but also effects intervention, capital flow measures, macro prudential measures, you know, how these policies interact to, uh, uh, you know, to help uh, the macro economy of countries. But again, this is uh, technical work that we have there, just to tell you that we are thinking very hard about all these issues. And there's not one simple answer because there are many countries for whom flexible exchange rates work extremely well. I'll stop with that. Okay, Gita, thank you. Um, question for Matthew from Greg at Oak Tree Capital. Stock markets are shooting up while the real economy is in crisis with unemployment very high. How can we avoid this situation which seems to be increasing inequality? Briefly, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, well, I, I think first of all, we have to acknowledge as some people still seem unable to do that stock markets have no relationship to the real economy whatsoever. In fact, to the degree that a large number of corporations make bigger profits in a time of pandemic, they will inevitably go up faster. So we shouldn't be looking at the level of stock market as a, an indicator of economic progress at all. In fact, perhaps the reverse. 
Um, secondly, we need to really be working out systems to clamp down better on the types of tax avoidance that go on, which contribute to that stock market increase. So if, you, if you're talking about, for example, the massive amounts of tax avoidance or tax uh, deductions, which are given to people for private health and uh, pensions, for example, uh, which then go into funds which invest in those uh, stocks, uh, but also uh, looking at the ways in which people compensate their most highly paid employees, uh, increasingly these days, not so much by actual salaries, but by, pen by bonuses and by stock issues, which again uh, inflate the value of the stock prices on the, on the stock market. So and I think there are, there are many things that can be done, uh, particularly in, in OECD countries where stock markets are a massive issue, um, to actually uh, reverse the, the effect that inequality, uh, that those stock market increases are having on, on inequality. Can I just come back on one other thing quickly, which is to mm. say that I think um, on, the, on the austerity issue, which is, I, I get that the IMF has come a long way uh, in the last 10, 15 years from not being prepared to talk about poverty and inequality to where it's really important. But surely now inequality should be at the center of all IMF country programs. There should be an analysis of what all countries are doing it's kind of, as the IMF would put it, macro critical in every single country. And for example, we need social spending flaws in all of the IMF programs, not just in the ones for lower income countries. So I think there's a lot more to do. And the real risk is if we don't get the international measures that people have been talking about, allowing countries to collect more tax revenue, debt cancellation, SDRs, aid, whatever the IMF may think in principle, when they look at the budget numbers, they will go, sorry, but you have to bring down your debt burden and you have to reduce your budget deficit. And the only way to do that, if you can't dramatically increase your tax revenue, is to have austerity. And that's my real fear, is that we won't do enough on the international front. I know the IMF is pushing for that to happen. I know people like Minister Jaffa and Safa are pushing really hard for that. People, all of us are pushing really hard for that. But if we don't do that, we are certainly going to have austerity again, whether we want it or not. Uh, Gita, that's a direct challenge to you from Matthew. So why don't you tackle that? I, the, the concern that countries will not have the, the uh, you know, the revenues that they need to spend, the concern that there will be premature withdrawal of support is top of mind at the IMF. And we are doing everything we can to ensure that, uh, you know, uh, developing countries, the countries that need our assistance, uh, are able to tackle this crisis, make sure that there is sufficient healthcare spending, that there are basic livelihoods being met. So yes, now, uh, and we will continue to do that. So I guess, the, I mean, and I agree with all the points that were raised, for instance, in the point, the fact that if you're a country that's already with very high levels of debt, uh, then in that sense, you know, giving you additional uh, lending, which only just adds to your debt, is not going to solve your problem. Or asking a country to then go into very serious fiscal cuts that uh, takes away from the social safety net is absolutely not going to solve the problem. So we completely recognize that that would be a country that would need to undertake uh, a debt restructuring. And this is exactly why it's a, it's a point that we have made over and over again. Uh, and the common framework, which again, like I said, has been agreed upon by the, uh, by the G20 is an important step in that direction because it's not enough to just get debt relief from official creditors. You know, there are, there are con some countries for whom private credit, most of their debt is with private creditors, non-Paris club members. So all of those fronts we have to work on. So we are, we are working uh, on towards that. But let me just step back and also tell you that we have many members who benefit obviously tremendously from market access. And from their perspective, it's not just what we tell them, it's what they want too. And they would like to maintain their reputation and their market access. And so for them, their strategy is going to be what's best for them. And so I'm just saying there's not as if one, you know, one solution fits all and every single country who has debt uh, needs to have their debt restructured. So I'm just gonna uh, stop with that. Thank you, Geeta. Um, Minister Safa, two questions for you. First from Mika in Kenya. Many are calling for an increase in IMF special drawing rights, as well as debt cancellation to help boost lower income 
country liquidity to fight COVID-19. How helpful would that be for Sierra Leone and others in the region? That's one. And then the second question is from Paolo de Renzio. Which tax reforms might be both technically and politically feasible in developing countries to tackle inequality? Minister Safa, those two for you. Thank you very much. Well, on the second point, I think the, the, the on overall, you need to talk about progressive taxes. Uh, we've introduced in the property tax where in we more of the high income people have been taxed because what used to be the situation, it was a flat rate more or less, but now the progressive nature of the tax which we are doing is going to eat more of the, the half as against the, 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 the have not. So that's one. And, and the overall, you, the, you need tax reforms that takes more, that increases disposable incomes to the poor, that probably takes disposable income rather uh, reduces, this, uh, uh, reduces money resources from the wealthy. So we, 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 we also need, on the, on the issue of the, the, the SDI, I, I was not quite clear what he was talking about. But what I would like to see here is that in terms of IMF resources, if I got the argument clear, Sorry, could you come again on the first point, the first question, please? I didn't get it right. Yeah, sure. Uh, so M many are calling for an increase in IMF special drawing rights, you know, granting liquidity to poorer countries, as well as debt cancellation to help poorer countries uh, to give them extra liquidity to fight COVID-19. Would that be helpful to Sierra Leone and others uh, and your neighbours? On the top of the envelope, you would think it would be helpful, but the fact that there are loans is also going to increase the debt itself. So, and mm. the IMF is not known for giving grants, it's, it's a loan. So, you, 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 you really cannot eat your cake and have it. So, maybe one of the things we can understand, the thing I would like the IMF to look at, is the recalculations of our GDP. They need to understand that in the face of COVID, the GDP figures are dropping, I mean, in terms of absolute numbers. <laughs> So if they start looking at debt store GDP ratio, the possibility of putting countries in debt distress technically exists, you know? So maybe it may not be the IMF window, but it's to enable to probably, uh, not authorize, probably to, to be a little bit flexible with countries that partner with, to go out there and seek for additional financing elsewhere, which, you know, the, the, of course the issue of constitutionality will come in, but maybe the constitutional boundaries is something we need to redefine. Because I would imagine the MF don't want to give more debt out there. I mean, at this, I mean, they, 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 they give more loans to countries, increase debt when they are debt distressed. They may be defeating themselves. So I understand that argument. There are several of those arguments to them. But at the same time, because of the concessionality, or the non constitutionality, uh, zero con non uh, constitutionality conditions which they have, that is also block countries from partnering with where there are other countries or agencies partnering with uh, developing countries. So maybe we need to probably recalculate our GDP themselves. I mean, against the background that the drop in GDP, it's not the making of the countries as a result of the pandemic. So that we have uh, some window to go out there and get some private capital. That can help the situation. Thank, thank you, Minister. Uh, question now for Joyti from Mara Bollis. Uh, this is a, a question which uh, attempts to tease out something you mentioned earlier in your commandments, Joyti. You spoke about companion indicators to GDP to more fully measure the well-being of a country. Which would you, which indicator would you suggest should be elevated? Yes, thanks. You know, I really think that since we can't dislodge GDP despite all our best efforts, and since all the other indicators of well-being tend to be very multidimensional, we should at least accompany it with some basic things. And we could do, I would suggest two indicators, both labor market indicators. One would be regular formal employment and the other would be the, the median wage, just as indicators of people's well-being. It would also force a lot of developing countries to start collecting that data on a regular basis, which they do not, many do not, even the ones who could afford to. And I think it's important also for citizens to know what exactly is going on in a country. So I would basically put these two employment indicators, good quality employment and median wage. But I don't know. I mean, I, I would really appreciate uh, hearing what Gita thinks about this, because honestly, if the IMF decided to include that in its, its sort of typical indicators for every country, 
in every quarter. I think it would just change the whole landscape of how policymakers look at these. Uh, Gita, that that's a direct invitation, which it would be wrong of me not to pass on. Do you want to do you want to uh, respond? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. I think the simple answer is that if if the data existed, because we don't we don't do our own surveys, right? It's the it's the, it's the uh, official statistics that have to exist, and so I agree completely with Jayati that it would be fantastic if we had quarterly information on employment, unemployment. Of part-time employment, wages per hour, um, it, it would be absolutely terrific. But if we think that we have incomplete data on GDP, it's even harder to get data uh, on employment or any of these statistics. So I would say, and I agree with you here, which is I think the first step is for countries themselves to, uh, to make that investment in making sure that you have uh, data available at the quarterly level. In fact, there are many developing countries for which we don't even have reliable employment data at the annual level. I mean, you might get it once in, a, once in 10 years. So that data just doesn't exist. I also wanted to just uh, mention one thing that Minister Safa mentioned. Uh, an SDR allocation would not add to the debt of countries. It would be an increase in your reserves. It would not be an increase in the debt of countries. Now, of course, the, you know, the allocation happens by the size of a country's quota. So, for instance, let's suppose that there's a $500 billion allocation, about 16 billion of that would go to low income countries, which is not trivial, but then the rest goes to, you know, uh, countries that, yeah, that uh, are of higher income levels. But again, at the IMF, we clearly are supportive of the need for an SDR, a new SDR allocation. But again, just to clarify that that does not add, add to the debt of countries. Okay, thank you, Gita. Question for Matthew from uh, Ketty in Georgia. Economic inequality is one thing, but what does your index tell us about what countries are doing to fight gender inequality and who's doing the right thing? Matthew, briefly, if you wouldn't mind. Yes, so, uh, and this brings me to, to an issue I met, wanted to raise earlier on um, and, and Gita has just raised which is lack of data. Uh, so we, we started out wanting to look at every single thing we look at from the point of view of gender inequality. Um, and we found in, in compiling the index that we can only do that for certain things. So actually getting a breakdown of what's happening to inequality within households, between men and women, most countries don't collect those numbers. They just collect households, lumping men and women together. Um, where we've been able to really take out um, and do much more on, uh, on women's rights and on gender inequality is on the labour front, where we look in the yeah. index at whether there are laws which exist which deal with non-discrimination, which deal with equal pay, uh, which deal with rape, which deal with sexual uh, harassment, and also uh, parental leave provisions which make it easier for, uh, for women to... to uh, share the burden of unpaid care, particularly where there's a paternity leave. And we find that it's been one of the areas where there's been a lot of progress on paper in recent years. Lots of countries introducing new laws. As I said at the beginning, there's still quite a lot to do. But the problem is that then those laws don't get implemented. And I think the real challenge for the, for the international community is how do we move, how do we increase those standards going forward? So that, for example, we have rape laws which are based on consent, not violence so that women have a higher, higher chance of actually getting their cases prosecuted and won. Uh, we also have, uh, we need to have essentially uh, laws which are looking at uh, non-discrimination and equal pay in the way that Iceland has, where you have to have an independent audit of your, uh, whether you're giving equal pay or not. And that just shouldn't just apply to gender, it should also apply to race. Um, so that you can really see how everything can be enforced and change can really be uh, generated. What we've seen, I think, in the UK in the last few years is that simply making these issues transparent doesn't really generate change on the whole. Uh, you need to go beyond that. And we really also do need to provide more data. So, for example, we still don't really have a good system for judging whether sp government spending is getting forked to women, how taxes impact on women. There are efforts to do gender responsive budgeting across the world, but they uh, are only applying in some countries. So there's a huge amount more that needs to be done so we can really measure what the impact of gender inequality is. And, and uh, that's certainly what we want to do going forward to include more on that in, in the CRI. 
Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Gita, I've got one more question for you from Nabil in Lebanon, who's not a happy customer. Why does the IMF shy away from calling for a permanent wealth tax while it has no issue with uh, calling for increasing VAT, excise tax or flexibilization of labour? So firstly, I don't think we have a uh, blanket uh, rule that says that countries should increase their uh, VAT. It depends a lot on where the VAT is level is at this point. So there are countries where VAT levels are are already at, at, uh, uh, you know, at, some, at, a, at a level at which it seems perfectly fine. So we don't have a, 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 you know, a recipe of saying that all countries should do X, Y, and Z. And this is why also on the question of the wealth tax, I would take a tailored approach, which is I would say that, you know, firstly, you want to put a tax in place that actually yields revenues. And what we've known from the past in terms of countries that have implemented wealth taxes, you haven't seen it yield very good results uh, in terms of raising revenue. So there, there would be other tools that might work better. So, I mean, so just as a rule, um, I, we don't have a one size fits all recipe for countries in terms of what taxes they should do and what they shouldn't do. Thank you, Geeta. Okay, listen, uh, we've come to the end of the Q&A session. I'm gonna ask just one more question for all panelists to answer before wrapping up. Um, and this question was, specially uh, requested by one Max Lawson of East London. In a single tweetable sentence to close, what's the one policy that you want to see governments rally behind to ensure we build a better, fairer future in the recovery from the COVID-19 crisis? Uh, if I could have a quick response from each of you. Geeta, since you're in my Zoom uh, line of vision, if I could come to you first. Well, I think for me, what's top of mind right now is to ensure that there is universal availability of, the va of vaccines um, that have ended this pandemic everywhere. Um, the way things stand, we are going to see some countries, advanced economies get there much faster than poorer countries will. Uh, many, that, many of them will have to wait until 2022. And that, that doesn't really, that should not happen. Uh, we have, uh, we should make sure that vaccines are widely available. We know that many countries like the UK, the US, Canada have money, many multiples of the doses that they will need given the fact that many vaccines are hitting their target. So there has to be a mechanism to ensure that these excess vaccines go very quickly to the needy countries. Uh, so for me, that's top of mind because right now I can't look past the pandemic and that's ending the pandemic sooner would help uh, bring back recoveries much faster everywhere in the world. Thank you, Geeta. Um, that was less of a tweet and more of a thread. Uh, Joyti, if I could go to you next. Thanks. I think I would basically appeal to both governments and international organizations to move away from thinking about BJ, uh, GDP and balance of payments and focus all the policy measures on livelihoods, health, and resilience. I think that's what the pandemic has taught us. Inequality will automatically reduce if we all focus on ensuring good quality livelihoods, health, and resilience. Thank you, Jyoti. Minister Safa, would you like to have a go? Yeah, um, I, I would definitely advise we go for livelihood because it's, it's important to restore livelihood to job creations. Maybe this, it's about time we get concessional financing for major public works, uh, food, uh, agriculture, and few other uh, infrastructure development that can create jobs. It's the support to SMEs is very critical because most of the SMEs lost their income during the COVID, and we have to restore that. Because even when we have a vaccine, people have to buy it. For them to buy it, they need resources. I mean, except we, if we can also get concessional financing to access the vaccine themselves, other situation not we return to normal. Thanks. Thank you. Matthew, Mr. Index, what's your one tweetable policy solution? Please unmute, Matthew. <laughs> 
Sorry, can I have two quick ones? One is uh, directed at governments in general, uh, one of which, which is introduce solidarity taxes to fund universal health care and universal social protection. That's something that has come out as a, I think a bit of a consensus on this, on this uh, event. And the second at the international community is cancel debt now, stop messing around, make sure private creditors are involved and get the debt cancelled immediately. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to all the panellists uh, who um, uh, had to face some pretty tough questions. Uh, so my thanks to Matthew Martin uh, at Development Finance International, Minister Jacob Jusu Safa uh, of Sierra Leone, Gita Gopinath, Chief Economist at the IMF, and Joy Ghosh at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Just a reminder that the Inequality Index can be found at Inequality Index, all one word, Dot org, and you can check out what your government's doing. Apart from that, uh, thanks a lot for joining us. See you soon.